interviewing Patrick on stage today is our own very, our very own Dr. Sugar. Dr. Sugar is a former vice president of primary care of Eisenhower Health and is also a clinical professor of family medicine at the Keck School of Medicine at USC. Dr. Sugar is a proponent of functional medicine, a focus on treating the cause of the disease rather than just treating the, the disease with drugs and procedures. Patrick Radden Keith is a staff writer at The New Yorker. He is the author of five books, Chatter, The Snakehead, Say Nothing, Empire of Pain, and Rogues, and has written extent extensively for many publications, including The New Yorker, Slate, and The New York Times Magazine. His work has been recognized with a Guggenheim Fellowship, the National Magazine Award for Feature Writing, and the Orwell Prize for Political Writing. Empire of Pain was awarded the Bally Gifford Prize for the best nonfiction book published in the English language. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sugar and Patrick Radden Keith. I'm the far guy. Oh, wow, I've been looking forward to this, and uh, Patrick, and it was great to have a few minutes to get to meet you. Uh, for those of you who haven't read the book yet, I highly recommend it. And in order to keep this whole family straight, I did listen to it twice. I listened to books. And it's, uh, you know, one of the dust jacket people said, it's, it's, like, it's written like a novel about a family. It's not just writing about the problem of opioids and the opioid epidemic or even a company while it's about a company, but this company was always privately owned by a family who, you know, as someone who's lived this whole thing, I mean, I entered medicine 50 years ago at UCLA when Valley of the Dolls and the Barbiturates and the Mill Town that you talk about was there, and uh, overdose deaths were based on those drugs plus alcohol most commonly, and they gave way to, I didn't realize Arthur Sackler was part of developing Valium and Librium, and uh, he helped invent drug advertising that I've lived with for better or for worse. Uh, one of his positive things is, uh, is that he helped develop drugs for psychotic people so that they didn't have to stay in mental hospitals out of control. It's a family that started off uh, great. Uh, Jewish parents uh, emigrated from Europe, met in Brooklyn, had three boys who all became doctors. You know, the, the, dr the dream of all Jewish parents is <laughs> to become doctors. I learned that certainly at UCLA. And, um, and then went on, the oldest of the sons died before even OxyContin came out. But you, you exposed one comment is how it's a family who became very capitalistic. The sons actually never practiced medicine. They got involved with advertising and all this. And uh, they lost their moorings. And, uh, and what's fascinating is how those three boys, the first generation, you can criticize a lot. I mean, Arthur had three wives at the same time, which is fascinating. But, uh, but it was really that next generation that lacked the empathy and, uh, and, and, and really the behavior became quite evil. So what led you into this? And, and uh, tell us more about developing this Sackler story. Yeah, absolutely. I should say, uh, first of all, thank you for doing this. It's great to have the opportunity to chat with you about the book, and thank you all for coming. I've never been here before. Um, beautiful, beautiful part of the world. Um, and this seems like an incredible institution and, uh, and a great community, so I feel very lucky to, uh, to be here with you today. Um, I came to this from a very weird angle. I had been doing, you know, my day job as a, I write for the New Yorker magazine, and I write about all kinds of different things, but one subject I had been really interested in was illegal drugs. And so I had been writing about the Mexican drug cartels, Chapo Guzman and the Sinaloa cartel, and I was really looking at these cartels more as um, businesses than anything else. So obviously they're terrible, violent criminal organizations, but they're also multi-billion dollar cross-border commodities enterprises. And originally, 10 years ago, I wrote a cover story for the New York Times Magazine that was like a Harvard Business School case study of a Mexican drug cartel. 
um, trying to figure out how they, they operated their business. And what I noticed was that they have different products, cocaine, heroin, methamphetamine, marijuana, that they move across the border into the United States. And in 2010, they suddenly started sending more heroin into the US, and nobody could figure out why. Why is it that the cartels would suddenly send more heroin? And the answer turned out to be demand, and that there was a generation of Americans who suddenly were buying heroin on the street who hadn't started with heroin. They started with painkillers that were approved by the FDA and prescribed by doctors and sold by Big Pharma. And this was the opioid crisis, that you had this crisis of addiction um, that is obviously very complicated. We can talk about it. There have been different phases of the crisis. It goes back almost three decades now. Um, there goes that phone. And, um, and uh, it, uh, I feel like it's good luck. Um, and the, the crisis has, has by now killed more than half a million Americans. And it's not getting better. Um, 100,000 Americans died of overdoses just last year. So it's a complicated problem, but what I learned as I looked into it was that the origins were kind of explicable, that it really started with one drug, OxyContin, which was this very powerful painkiller that was released in 1996 and became the blockbuster drug of its day. There was a moment, actually, when it, I remember when it, when it eclipsed Viagra as the best-selling <laughs> drug. It's a big deal for the, uh, for the company that made it, which was Purdue Pharma, this Connecticut um, uh, pharmaceutical company. And what I learned is that Purdue Pharma was privately held and that it was entirely owned by the Sackler family. And this really struck me because I knew that name. I grew up in Boston and uh, I, I took a year off after high school because I didn't get into the college I wanted to go to. And I worked for a year in Harvard Square and I would go to the Sackler Museum in Harvard Square. I ended up eventually getting into that college and going to Columbia in New York, and on the weekends I would go to the Sackler Wing at the Met. After college I moved to England, and the Sackler name was all over London, at the British Museum, at the National Gallery, there's a Sackler Library at Oxford. Um, and eventually I lived in Washington, D.C., where there's a Sackler Gallery on the Mall, in the Smithsonian. So this was this family that, where their name was everywhere, they were kind of known as a philanthropic family, and I didn't really, I'd never given any thought to who they were. I thought they were probably like the Rockefellers or the Carnegies. I thought this was some family that had probably made its money in the 19th century, you know, in the railroads or something. And it really struck me as, as strange to learn that, in fact, the vast bulk of that fortune had been made in recent decades through the sale of this drug, OxyContin. So I went to the website of Purdue Pharma, the company, and I knew at this point that they still own the company. And I knew that the family dominated the board of directors of the company. So I went to the website of Purdue Pharma and I started looking for the Sackler name. And I looked and I looked and I couldn't find it. It was nowhere on the website. So that was the paradox that started this book, was the idea that you had the name everywhere in the world of art, universities, elite institutions, these kind of blue chip institutions where there were Sackler wings and Sackler halls and Sackler buildings but then not on the company that had generated all of this revenue and a company that ended up getting in quite a bit of trouble because it essentially had helped ignite this terrible public health crisis that has killed more than half a million Americans. And so what I wanted to do in this book was not write an opioid crisis book per se, but do a kind of old fashioned family saga about three generations of this family. And it turns out, as you indicate, their history in the pharmaceutical industry goes way back beyond OxyContin, back in the 1950s. Fascinating. Just to put it in perspective, there have been Vicodin and Percodin uh, addicts, and I dealt with them in the 70s, but hydrocodone, which is the Vicodin Norco, only comes five, seven and a half, and 10 milligrams. And then oxycodone, which is twice as strong as hydrocodone, also comes five, seven and a half, and 10 milligrams. And I've had plenty of patients who were taking eight or 10 of these a day and who were opioid addicts at that time. But OxyContin, which is oxycodone in a different formulation, 
supposedly longer acting, but you spell out how it really wasn't longer acting, you could go all the way up to 80 milligrams. So it was, you know, eight times more than even the strongest oxycodone previous to that. So it just blew the opioid, the prescription opioid use right off the, you know, that's why it was so much more of a problem. And it, and, and by the help of the Sacklers, we were basically told we had to believe every patient's pain story. Still, my nurses have to ask every patient at every visit, are you having pain? You know, it has, may have nothing to do with why they're there. And, and, um, and to keep my medical license in California, I had to do two hours of pain education every year. You know, this zeitgeist of uh, un, untreated pain sort of overwhelmed even within medicine and how the Sacklers drove that to coincide with their sale of OxyContin. Uh, absolutely. I mean, and this is part of what's so striking about this story. I, I should say, just to be, to be uh, clear for those of you who aren't familiar with the book, um, so it's a biography of three generations of this family, which is not to suggest that the family cooperated with the writing of the book. Um, this was not an authorized biography. Um, none of the members of the Sackler family agreed to talk with me. And in fact, um, they, they started threatening to sue me before I'd even had a chance to start writing. Um, it was announced in a, in a trade publication that I was gonna do the book and I, I got a 17 page letter from a lawyer uh, for the family. Um, and they kind of kept up with the legal threats for the next few years. But I was able to gather a lot of really interesting information, in part because I talked to people who'd worked at the company and knew the family, um, and in part because I got access to tens of thousands of pages of documents that had come out through litigation. So I got these internal documents telling the story that you just told, but from the perspective of the company. So originally they had a morphine drug called MS Contin. Mm -hmm. And the novelty of this drug was, it was just morphine, but they had a special seal that they devised, a coating for the pill. And the idea was you could take a bigger dose and slowly it would filter into your bloodstream over the course of a number of hours. And eventually, this was a successful drug for the company. It brought in a few hundred million dollars a year, which was big for them at the time. Um, and the patent is running out on MS Contin, their big hit. And so you can see these internal discussions, because I have the emails, in which they talk about, well, we need to find something else to replace this. Um, what if we took oxycodone and we used that with the Contin seal? You could have these big doses. And they had this problem, which is that, as you indicated, opioids have, you know, we've known for thousands of years that products that derive from the opium poppy, that's what we're talking about here, have two qualities. They have this amazing therapeutic quality, which is that they can ease pain, ease terrible pain. But then they have this drawback, which is that they can be quite addictive. And doctors have always, you can go back to Hippocrates, we've known this, it's not new. And so as a consequence, in the United States and a lot of countries, physicians would prescribe these drugs, but it was kind of the thing you kept on the top shelf that you prescribed when other remedies had failed, because you were worried about addiction. So they come up with the idea of releasing this oxycodone drug, but they have these internal conversations where they say, you know, the problem is there's only so many people with cancer. <laughs> what if we could find a way to market these drugs for moderate pain as well as severe pain? So back injuries, sports injuries, post-operative care, you name it. And the problem was that opioids had a stigma. And they talk about this in the emails. They say the problem is it's got this stigma. There's a sort of a sense that drugs have, uh, different drugs have a, different personalities. And if, you're, you know, if your grandmother is going on morphine, that means your grandmother's going to die. So how can we overcome that? And what they said is, well, we're going to say it's not addictive. <laughs> that for thousands of years, there's been this idea that there's a good quality and a bad quality with these drugs until now we figured out how to uncouple them. And because of that seal, it'll slowly filter into your bloodstream. You don't need to worry. It can't be abused. It's not dependent. There's really no side effects whatsoever. The original marketing tagline on OxyContin was, it's the one to start with and the one to stay with. And they proceeded to send out an army of sales reps to make this case. And you said they had 80 milligram pills. Originally, they had 160 milligram pills 
which they ended up taking off the market when um, state officials in Maine said, this is enough to kill it. Like a kid could take one of these pills and it could kill him. And so they pulled it off the market. But the 80 milligram pills are still on the market today. I still remember the ads in the journals because they would have a bed of nails and they'd basically say, if you have arthritis of your spine and you're trying to go to bed, it's like living on a bed of nails. Now, there's very few people in this room that don't have some degree of arthritis of their spine. It happens at about age 50. So, um, so it, it's, it's there, but you're right. They really market it. I used MS Cotton as a hospice doctor, and it was always for end-of-life care, and it was very effective. But that was our identity. You point out something that I didn't appreciate, that actually oxycodone is stronger than morphine. Twice it's as twice as strong. Yeah. So uh, this so-called safer pill, which most docs believed uh, was being used and, and that it was going to last for 12 hours, you point out that it didn't, um, but it, it became pretty apparent early on that for most doctors, we realized this had a problem. I was in the 90s working at UC San Diego at a downtown clinic that they had where uh, lots of chronic pain people were coming in every month for their Oxycontin refills. And uh, we, we were able to do that. One, we had to believe them. They did have documented spinal disease. And uh, interestingly enough, th those patients were following our pain contract. That is, they weren't escalating their dosages and they weren't you know, losing the dog ate my pills or I flushed it down the toilet or whatever. And, uh, but you know, as a faculty working in this clinic, under the, this thing where we had to believe every patient's word, we probably we realized that, that most of the drugs we were prescribing were being sold on the street. But there was not a lot we could do to actually stop that at the time. It was the politics of the time. And it was, it was not a play. It was the only clinic I ever worked in that I did not enjoy seeing patients. Yeah, I mean, there, there was a huge change, really, in the way in which pain was treated. And what's so fascinating in retrospect is to see the degree to which industry money, and it wasn't just Purdue Pharma, because after the success of OxyContin, there were other pharmaceutical companies that introduced their own long-acting opioids, seeing how successful OxyContin had been. Um, but the industry started pouring money into this idea of, um, you know, the, of pain as the fifth vital sign. The idea that, and you've all, I'm sure, had this experience. You go to the doctor, you go to the hospital, they ask you what's your pain threshold, you know, what's your pain level on a scale of one to 10, happy face to sad face, where would you point? And of course, I mean, What's interesting about this, right, is the, the industry suggested, this is, it's like taking somebody's blood pressure. It's a vital sign. It's an objective measurement. But um, <laughs> this is a, a joke in my house because my wife is a big marathon runner and a great athlete. And um, in her eyes, I am an enormous wimp. And, um, <laughs> and she'll talk about the fact that you could take, you know, it's like the, it's like the, uh, the little hammer for your reflexes on your knee or something, you could apply the exact same amount of pain to my wife and to me. Some of the women in the room might suggest that this is broadly a gender difference between women and men. <laughs> and, you know, my wife will say, eh, it's a four, it might be a five, and I'll say, it's a ten, it's a ten, you know, make it stop. <laughs> um, and you, you realize that, I mean, it, it's kind of calm. It's like the emperor's new clothes in retrospect, right? That there was this whole idea that, it, that that's an objective thing, that you tell your doctor, oh, I'm, a, I'm experiencing an eight, and that that's supposed to mean the same thing as the previous patient who said, I'm experiencing an eight. And yet, this is an idea that was very widely adopted. And I've certainly talked to a lot of physicians who today feel guilt about how... Um, how extensively they prescribe drugs like OxyContin. But what they say in their defense was, you felt at the time as though you would get in trouble for under-treating pain. That's exactly right. Exactly right. The, um, let's talk a few minutes about the, the American capitalist family that the Sacklers represent. You know, Balzac has this quote where, behind every great fortune, there's a great crime. And, um, and the... Uh, <laughs> You know, that's and used at the Mario Puzo used it at the end of the Godfather book. And then uh, 
You know, in family therapy, they, they paraphrase Tolstoy's comment about families that, that, that what, they, what they will say is functional families are all alike, but dysfunctional families are dysfunctional in their own way. And uh, uh, clearly, the Sacklers were a, a case study, which you do so incredibly well. But, you know, to, were they really a one-off, totally very different than others? Because you talk about rogues and scoundrels and murderers and families and stuff. Uh, put it in perspective as a capitalist family. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's interesting, right? So the kind of writing that I do... Um, I, I like to tell stories. They're true stories, and there's end notes at the end of the book that you know, most people never look at, just to, to show you that, um, that I, I've kind of done the research and it's all true. But I'm drawn to stories about characters, to narrative nonfiction. I want the book to read like a novel would. Um, but when you do that, the trick is you can't make it up. So um, you know, your story is really only as good as the characters you find, and these are real people. And Arthur Sackler, who's the oldest of the original three brothers, is just one of the great characters I've ever encountered. It's like he walked out of the pages of a Saul Bellow novel. He's this incredible um, kind of hustler who grows up in this immigrant family. You know, his parents are, uh, had come from Europe. They, um, they didn't speak great English. They spoke Yiddish in the home. They experienced terrible anti-Semitism. Um, they really struggled during the Great Depression. But they had this real American dream sense that in one generation, they were going to raise these three kids. The kids were going to get a great education. They were going to become doctors. And in the scope of one generation, they would go from living on the fringes of Brooklyn to absolutely making their mark on the country and ascending to the highest ranks of, um, of the economy and the culture. And they were right. And I hope that when you're reading the book, there's some excitement. I mean, I often hear from people that they, they find themselves rooting for Arthur Sackler. And at, at first, he seems like he's doing all the right things. You know, he's, he, he's kind of, he, he gets very into medical advertising. He becomes sort of the Don Draper of medical advertising in the 1950s. Um, figuring out how to, how to market these different drugs and market them to doctors. And I interviewed these old guys, guys in their 90s, who knew Arthur. They called themselves med men um, uh, back, in the, uh, back in the 50s. And they say, Arthur Sackler invented the wheel. So much of today, what you experience in terms of pharmaceutical advertising, sprang from the head of this genius guy uh, way back then. And, and um, the problem was that he had conflicts of interest. So you mentioned that Arthur had, um, there, w there was one period of time, in, in, I describe this in the book, where there were three women, all of them living in Manhattan, all of them calling themselves Mrs. Arthur M. Sackler. Um, and, uh, you know, he had this tendency to have things overlap in his life, and he had multiple different, um, <laughs> multiple different businesses as well. It wasn't just in his personal life, but in his business life. So there's a, you know, he had one of the two leading uh, pharmaceutical advertising firms on Madison Avenue, um, and there was a rival, the Froelich Company, um, that was the other big company. And all the big drug companies, if you, you either had your business at one or you had your business at the other. Only after Arthur Sackler died in 1987 did we learn that Arthur also had a secret stake in the Froelich Company, his <laughs> rival. So he actually was completely controlling the industry, but he very carefully didn't want people to know. And the, the thing that is most interesting in some ways and I think distinctive about the Sacklers is it's certainly true that great fortunes are made in America, sometimes uh, through people cutting corners, sometimes through people committing crimes or behaving unethically. Um, and it's also true that the wealthy uh, often will start to collect art. They will often get into philanthropy there's often a string attached, which is, I want my name on the building, please. Arthur had a lawyer, Arthur's longtime lawyer, said, you know, if you want your name on it, that's not charity. That's a business deal. Um, and Arthur starts giving money away in the 1950s. And I think he does it almost to distract people from the kind of grubby way in which he's actually making his money. And so the Sacklers become this kind of revered 
family and always have this stipulation that their name needs to go up. And I, it's truly, I, now that you know the name, I mean, it's, the name is now coming down, so it's not the same as it used to be. But it used to be that you could, once you're attuned to the Sackler name, you just start seeing it absolutely everywhere. When the book came out in, um, the book came out in Ireland, I did a, an interview with this very funny uh, Irish radio host. And I was talking about how the family has this mania for putting their name up on buildings left and right. And this guy said, just off the cuff, he said, um, so what you're saying is they had a, they had a sort of an edifice complex. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I, I thought, you know, four years I worked on this damn book and that didn't occur to me, and this guy in like two seconds, you know, comes out with it. But, um, but I, I think, so for me, there's a kind of an, they're an extreme version, both in the sense that there, there were lines crossed and you see them kind of stray, and you do see a second generation that has just less kind of human feeling that grew up with great wealth and I think is deeply unsympathetic to the idea that just over the horizon, there are people taking your product and dying. There are kids taking it and dying. And there's a level of insensitivity that um, even today I find pretty galling. Uh, but there are also ways in which the Sacklers were, I think, quite particular. And I think some of it is the naming, uh, the naming thing, this, this desire to kind of, you know, some of this story is about the marketing of drugs. And some of it is about the marketing of the family itself, of the family name. You're a very brave man. I'm not sure if that's the word your wife would use. <laughs> but as, but you, had, uh, you had parked cars outside your home on the street uh, that were clearly from the Sackler uh, you know, influence. Because it was in 2017 that you exposed them uh, to in the New Yorker piece and, uh, and that what led to the book. But clearly they wanted to intimidate you um, in your book, Rogues, you know, you talk about El Chapo. Uh, you didn't know what, from prison. He was one of, because you had, you had written about him and you didn't know, oh my gosh. You have all these journalists in Mexico being assassinated, like 17 this year. Um, you know, tell me how you handle that, because clearly you're, you're, you got thick skin. Yeah, I mean, I... Uh, I wonder what my wife would say if she were here. <laughs> um, my wife's a lawyer, and she, she says she's my in-house counsel. Uh, the, um, she does have some rules. There are things I'm not allowed to write about. Uh, there, this is kind of a funny story, actually. We, the, about a, a couple of months ago, we, we have home offices that are next to each other, and I, we have one printer. It's in my office. And um, somebody sent me a tip because they wanted me to write a story about the Russian mob. And um, I printed out a bunch of documents that they'd sent me. And one of them was a, it was a, somebody had gotten a threat. And so it was like a, a text, series of text messages in Cyrillic. And then there was a photo of a dead body. Um, and I just printed this out and I put it on the printer and I, I went into the city and had some meetings. And I came back that night and all the stuff that had been in the printer tray was on my desk. And that, piece of paper was on the top, and someone had just written, no, in, 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 uh, in, in magic marker, um, which is my wife's way of telling me, yeah, you're not, you're not going to write that one. I mean, I, I um, listen, it's not, I, I'm pretty risk averse. I, I have small kids, and I think about that. I, I, in the context of the Sacklers, um, especially with all these legal threats, in a weird way, that was part of the story that I wanted to tell. So I went to law school before I became a writer. My wife's a lawyer. Um, and there are lawyers who are some of the villains in this book. And I, I think this happened. You know, Harvey Weinstein, Jeffrey Epstein. You get uh, people who behave in really appalling ways for a long period of time. And when the music finally stops, we all say, how did they get away with it for so long? Didn't people know? And the answer is often that they're surrounded by lawyers who went to fancy law schools like the one I did and work at fancy law firms and PR people and crisis consultants 
Um, McKinsey did a lot of work with the Sacklers and Purdue and ended up having to pay a $600 million fine uh, for having encouraged them to continue promoting opioids in the way that they were. Um, there's this professional class of enablers who I think um, abet this kind of appalling conduct. And so there was a weird sense in which even as they threw all this stuff at me, I was like, great, that's the story I'm trying to tell. I'm gonna put, you know, I would get this one awful lawyer who I developed this kind of epistolary relationship with. Um, he would send me these letters and at the top it would say, off the record, you know, not to be quoted in any way in your book. And of course, if you know anything about journalism, I need to agree to that, you know, that he can't just say that. And so I, I quote it all in the book. I, I just, I put the letters right in the book. So I, I, you know, I don't, I don't mean to sound cavalier, and I, and I try and be careful, and I should note, they threatened to sue me for two years, and the book came out a year and a half ago, and there's been no lawsuit. This was about intimidation. Um, and it didn't work, and it's part of the story I wanted to tell, is that I think that we as a society need to think about the ways in which the super elite, the kind of, you know, our own, our own version of the oligarchs, um, can get away with really appalling behavior and be insulated from the downstream consequences of the decisions that they make. In the last part of the book, you go into great detail about how this, the undoing of the Sacklers and the whitewashing of the name that happened, you know, and why universities held off the students. But, you know, there was a, there was a big lawsuit uh, from certain states against the Sacklers for hundreds of millions of dollars which they looked at as just an inconvenience, but it was against them, and they were supposed to accept this, this payment as, a, as retribution, but it clearly wasn't anywhere near enough. And then it goes on to the other one, and I know um, you, you actually weren't just a writer, because you described to me earlier uh, how some of the characters, some of the heroes of the book, like Nan Golden and others, it was your New Yorker piece in 2017 that helped catalyze uh, the, the final settlement, like the tobacco industry, that ended up being really big. Uh, talk about that. Yeah, I mean, the first thing I should say is I, I, don't, I like to keep my lanes pretty separate. So this is a book with a point of view. Um, and... I think it's a kind of accountability journalism, but I don't think of myself as an activist at all. There are activists in this story, um, and I, I think you know my job is to kind of go out there and tell the truth, and hopefully tell it in a way that people find you know that they want to engage with, they want to keep turning the pages and absorb the story. It's up for others to to do things about that. The, the Nan Golden is one of the great American photographers. Uh, an amazing artist, and um, in, uh, it was about 2014, 2015, she injured her wrist, and she was prescribed OxyContin, and she became addicted. And she transitioned, as a lot of people do, from OxyContin to heroin, and one night she went out and bought a bag of heroin and didn't realize it was laced with fentanyl, and she overdosed and she almost died, uh, but she survived. And she um, ended up in a treatment program in Massachusetts in, and, and went into recovery. And while she was recovering from this addiction to OxyContin, she picked up a copy of the New Yorker magazine, which had this article that I'd written about the Sacklers. And she had that same moment that I had where she said, wait a second, the Sacklers, I know that name, because Nan was a real creature of the art world. And we had this kind of amazing, she, I got an email from the studio of Nan Golden asking if I would meet with her. And we had tea in Tribeca. And she, she told me, she kept talking about how she'd been an activist during the AIDS crisis in the 80s and 90s. And she said, I'm gonna start a movement to get the museums to take down the Sackler name. And I'm, I am embarrassed to tell you that I, I thought, sure you are. <laughs> I just, I think I, I, didn't, I didn't take her seriously. I didn't believe she could do it. Um, and so I said, good for you. Keep, keep me posted on that. You let me know how that goes. <laughs> and, um, 
And she took off, and a couple of months later, she filtered into the Sackler wing at the Met, and she was with all these people who had joined this group she started. And suddenly, they all started shouting, and they pulled out banners, and they had made hundreds of little pill bottles, prescription pill bottles, and they threw them into the reflecting pool at the Met, and then they all did a die-in, and they all kind of lay down on the ground. And, and not long after that, they went to the Guggenheim on a Saturday night, which is the free night, so it's really busy. <laughs> and you know that snaking ramp in the Guggenheim? About a hundred people came in with her, and they all filtered up around that ramp. And they had in advance made these little pieces of paper that look like a doctor's prescriptions. They made 7,000 of them. And they said, OxyContin prescribed to you by the Sackler family. And on cue, they went to the top of the ramp and they released 7,000 of these things into the atrium of the Guggenheim. And it looked like a cloud. You know, It looked like a blizzard. And these things were all pinwheeling down. And Nan Golden, who remember, is one of our great photographers, in advance, had called the New York Times and said, you know, on Saturday night, you might <laughs> want to send a photographer to the Guggenheim. And just as a photographer myself, not to tell you how to do your job, but you might want to tell them to be down at the base of the atrium and point the camera up. And the paper ends up running this amazing photo of that protest in the Guggenheim. And they went to the Louvre in Paris. They went to the Victoria and Albert Museum in London place after place after place, and her movement just gathered steam. And eventually, these institutions start to take the Sackler name down, to chip it off the walls wow. at one place after another. And it starts with Tufts University, and then NYU, and the Louvre in Paris, and eventually the Guggenheim, and even the Met. If you go to the Met today, the Sackler wing is no longer the Sackler wing. And, you know, if I can claim any credit for this, it's, it's for writing an article that Nan Golden read. But she, if you think about it, was kind of the perfect weapon, because I said at the beginning, there are these two worlds. The world of the arts, where the Sackler name is everywhere, and the world of Big Pharma, where it's kind of hard to find their name, even though that's actually where the money is from. And Nan Golden, in her very person, she's this incredibly established artist whose photos hang in the collections of all of these museums. So she's somebody they have to take seriously. But she's also somebody who survived an addiction to OxyContin. And so she brings these qualities together, and she kind of goes to war on them. And that's the story that I tell in the last third of the book. Um, is it justice? No. I and mean, we can talk about how the whole legal settlement ended up. Um, but I do think that when you think about the fact that this family spent seven decades and hundreds of millions of dollars emblazoning its name in all these places, um, there's a poetry in the idea that an artist and a recovering OxyContin addict brought it down. Wonderful. Before I open it up to comments, I just want to say, please read the book. It's spellbinding, and it's, it reads like a novel. And, uh, and then, you know, I don't know if you've read Say Nothing, which is about the whole uh, Belfast situation, and, and it was, I believe it was part of the movie that, that won all the awards in Belfast. No, but, it wasn't. Though yeah. we are making a, we're making a 10-part dramatic series for yeah. FX next yeah. year based on that. But yeah. it's great. And then, uh, you know, the, the Rogues book that opens with the fact that you wrote about El Chapo in, in, in Mexico and, and he's in prison and, you didn't, and the lawyer contacts you about that. It's funny the you know he he exposes some of how El Chapo works as this drug cartel guy and he, and he finally decides to call the lawyer and the lawyer says El Chapo wants you to write his story write his his biography which you you of course declined my my in-house counsel uh, <laughs> <laughs> thought that that didn't so, seem like a great idea but anyway yeah. it's a, it's a treat to meet you and and to learn you about well. your Thank wonderful you. works Thank you Patrick um Debbie, we've yes. got, I don't know if we'll see the hands. We yes. will. All right, right Ruby, here. Ruby, you've got her right there. Okay. I've got you next. There's a streaming program out now about this whole, have, are you involved with that? Dope sick. Yes. Yeah, I'm not involved, but I know um, uh, 
Beth Macy, whose book it's based on, is a good friend. I think it's terrific. It's you very watch well it. done. Yeah. You don't mention the FDA. Oh, we can talk oh. about the FDA, oh, yeah. shall we? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, just briefly, you, you, may, you may be wondering how is it that the FDA signed off on all this. Um, and they tell this story in Dopesick, actually, and I tell it in the book. But the um, one answer is that there was a fellow at the FDA who was the official who was in charge of appro approving OxyContin both saying it's safe and that it works, but also approving, signing off on these bogus marketing claims that they made about how it couldn't be abused and what have you. And um, his name was Curtis Wright. And not long after signing off on OxyContin, Curtis Wright decided that he might be ready to leave government. And he thought perhaps he would get a job in the private sector. Do you see where this is going? Um, and about a year later, he ends up working at Purdue Pharma for three times his government salary. And um, I will say this, I mean, I have yet to meet anybody who will defend that arrangement. Nobody, ha I have yet to meet a single person who will say, oh yeah, that seems like a good thing for a regulator to do. Um, when, I, when I called Curtis Wright and got him at home, he, um, he got off the phone very quickly. Uh, he didn't offer a defense of it. Um, but there's nothing illegal about it. There's nothing illegal about it, and in fact, um, just a couple of months ago, there was a story in the New York Times saying that one of the top tobacco scientists at the FDA, who was very involved in, in how we regulate e-cigarettes, left to work, I think, for Philip Morris. So, um, so it, it's a hard one. I mean, I think that the, um, it's, um, it's, I thought of this book as a story chiefly about one family behaving pretty badly, but on a deeper level about the ways in which money corrupts the different public institutions that are out there that should be protecting us as citizens and as consumers. Um, and so I'm afraid it's not the finest hour of the FDA. I have a question. Um, you know that the Elizabeth Sackler Center for Feminist Art still has her name. I was wondering if you thought that there are, were family members that actually did try to do something in their own family because her children are all in music, et cetera? Yeah, this is a really good question. So let me, let me um, break this down for you. So there are three Sackler brothers, Arthur and then his brothers Mortimer and Raymond. Arthur, the oldest brother who I talked about, is Elizabeth Sackler's father. Arthur uh, purchased Purdue Pharma the company for his brothers in 1952, and he was a partner until the time of his death in the company. And Arthur dies in 1987, before the release of OxyContin, and his heirs sell their share to the other wings of the family. So Elizabeth Sackler, for instance, um, is very adamant, as is Arthur's, the third of Arthur's wives, his widow. Um, <laughs> the, um, they're both very adamant that Arthur shouldn't have been pulled into this. He died before OxyContin. He was a sainted figure. He was pure as the virgin snow. Um, and um, unquestionably, Arthur died before OxyContin. What's interesting to me is that the family used all of these tricks when they sold OxyContin that had been devised by Arthur. Like, he created the world in which OxyContin could do what it did. For me, as a writer, this is interesting, because there's a history going back, right? Um, I will say that Elizabeth um, and uh, Julian, Arthur's, Arthur's widow, now are very intent on saying, oh, we're nothing like those other Sacklers. It's, I mean, it's a little funny seeing the Valium Sacklers turn their, you know, look down their noses at their OxyContin cousins. Um, but, um, but they, you know, now they're very vocal about that. But up to the point where, up till 2017, up till a few months after my article came out, they never breathed a word in public about any objections to any of this. Um, there was never any sense at all that there was anything that troubled them. There's, there's a question, which I think a lot of these institutions face, which is, do you keep the name or not, right? The Elizabeth Sackler Center is named after Elizabeth Sackler, and she didn't, I mean, it's not named after Arthur, right? So to me, that seems like kind of a no-brainer. I don't know why you would penalize Elizabeth. Um, Harvard University has kept the Sackler Museum, and what they say is, Arthur Sackler didn't have anything to do with OxyContin. The gift was given earlier. Tufts took down the Arthur Sackler name 
because they said, the medical faculty said, and the medical students said, Arthur Sackler helped create the world of pharmaceutical advertising that you know, enabled OxyContin to do what it did, but also like, you know, has kind of given us a lot of what we, what we now, I mean, there's a lot of stuff in my book that Arthur Sackler did in the 1950s that was pretty reprehensible. I can give you any number of examples, but to give you just one. One of Arthur's big intuitions was that uh, when you're marketing drugs, it's not just the patient you're trying to market to, it's the doctor. It's the doctor who writes the prescriptions. And that the best way to do that is with another doctor. And later on with Purdue, what that means is Purdue sets up a speakers bureau in which they pay thousands of doctors to go out and give speeches to other doctors about how great OxyContin is. But in the 50s, Arthur puts out an advertisement for one of these drugs. And it says, uh, you know, this drug is clinically tested and approved, and there's the business cards of eight different physicians in different parts of the country. So late 1950s, there's an investigative journalist with the Saturday Review, and he sees this ad and he thinks, I want to know more about the clinical tests on these drugs. So he starts calling the doctors whose business cards are in the ad, only to discover that they don't exist. <laughs> so I don't know. I mean, do you want that guy's name on your medical school? Just another quick piece of trivia, which I found fascinating as a doctor, and some of you will too. If you've ever taken Senecot to help relieve constipation, that's a Purdue Pharma product. If you've ever used Betadine to you know, clean the skin before surgery, that's a product. And uh, Ceruminex to dissolve the, the earwax in your ears. You know, he actually bought a private company that made those three products yeah. as their cornerstone of their drug market and actually got pretty wealthy on those things. Absolutely. Well, yeah, I mean, it's funny. I, I, there, there were some of these old, old hands from Purdue who talked to me, because I interviewed a lot of people who worked at the company back in the day, and they talked to me about how exciting it was to have OxyContin, because OxyContin was the big drug that everybody wanted to, to, to help promote. Um, you know, if you were in sales or marketing, this was it. And, you know, one of these sales reps said, before OxyContin, I mean, we had, you know, it was a profitable company, but... Uh, we had an earwax remover. We had a laxative. You know, he said, he said I was a real hit at parties, you know. Um, I believe we have a question all the way in the back. Go ahead. Um, I had this question before you got to the advertising part of this. Um, one of my annoyances in watching television is that apparently we're one of only two countries, at least in the OECD, that allows television advertising of pharmaceuticals. Um, did Mr. Uh, Arthur have anything to do with that, or the uh, Sacklers uh, in general? Um, I don't know that that's something that we can lay on their doorstep. I mean, the um, Arthur certainly came up with really creative ways around some restrictions. Um, there's a story I tell in the book about how Librium was um, one of the first big hit drugs that he worked on. Um, it was a minor tranquilizer, um, a predecessor to Valium that Roche put out. And at the time, you couldn't do direct-to-consumer advertising of that kind of drug. And the, um, so what they did was he did a lot of marketing to doctors, and then they got Life Magazine to run an article about it. And of course, like Life Magazine had the, you know, Arthur's marketing people uh, there with them every step of the way. But no, listen, I agree. I think it's, it's shocking. We've all seen the, um, I was talking er just, just earlier about how um, this book just came out in, in Germany. So I was in, in, I did a tour in Germany talking about it in, in France before that. And when you go to other countries and you, and, and you talk to people about the way in which we are all just assaulted with drug advertising all the time, how you turn on the TV at night and you know, you get that guy at the end of the ad who talks really quickly and says, you know, side effects may include sudden death, you know. Um, the, uh, pe people are shocked. I mean, to them, it's, it's dystopian what we live with. Um, but I don't, that, that is, uh, as much as I'm, you know, I'm inclined to blame the Sacklers for all kinds of things, I don't, I don't know that that's one that I would, I would lay on their, on their doorstep. I believe there's another question way in the back. Uh, yes, <clears throat> as a, a pharmacist for uh, practicing for 50 years, I can't tell you how many times I call doctors for okay and many addictive drugs, the barbiturates, the amphetamines, codeine, 
all of which are highly addicting, very dangerous, and the doctors would often look at, or the nurse would look at the bill. If the patient didn't owe them any money, they used to use five words, give him what he wants. And then over and over again, it was a matter of money. And if the patient's the doctor would not write a prescription for it, the uh, patient would go elsewhere and the doctor would lose that income. So, so it's about money all, all over the place, as you point out with the FDA. And then, as you know, the pharmacies like the Walgreens of the world would just find billions of dollars that they paid off for, for their part in this thing. So it was a vast conspiracy. Not to defend the sacros, but everyone's to blame. Absolutely, yeah. Listen, I, and I should say, to be very clear, I mean, the, the, the case that I make in, um, uh, in the book is not that the Sacklers deserve exclusive blame for the opioid crisis. There, it, believe me, it's other pharmaceutical companies as well. It's, it's doctors, both dirty doctors and naive doctors and doctors who are too busy uh, to actually take the time to look into it. It's the FDA. It's, I mean, you could go on. It's the medical associations. Um, it's the pharmacies. There's a, there's a lot of blame to go around. It, it takes a village to get to, um, to get to more than half a million people dead. Um, but I, I, I think the role of doctors is really significant in this. And um, in some cases, you had people who were purely corrupt, who ran pill mills, basically. Um, and in a lot of instances, I think you had people, I've had many doctors say to me, listen, I got into this business because I want to help people. I want to relieve pain. A new product comes on the market. They tell me it has no side effects. I don't have time to consult the medical literature myself, and it seems to work for my patients. We're in a business. We're moving people through quickly, right? That there's a kind of a, everything's happening in these little 15-minute increments. This is, I'm telling you the things that people say to me, kind of getting flustered about what happened. Um, and I think far too often they, uh, they were willing to prescribe these drugs, and then this is something we talked about earlier, but you get this kind of interesting moment where um, there's this revolution in terms of the way we treat pain. And one of the big criticisms is that the treatment of pain is not taught in medical schools properly. And I think that's actually a valid criticism. But what happens is into that vacuum comes the industry. So the industry provides all the education that physicians have about how to use these drugs. And what you, what you notice when you look into this is the industry, at least when it comes to opioids, teaches you how to get patients on the drugs, but not how to get them off. It's the one to start with and the one to stay with. And so I've interviewed a lot of physicians who say, you know, in a, in a surgical context, right, you give somebody an operation, you write them a prescription for often for a month of OxyContin, and then they're out, they're in your rearview mirror. When that patient comes back three weeks later and says, Doc, this is a little weird. I'm only supposed to be taking them every 12 hours, but I feel like I need to take them every eight hours. I'm taking them too often. I'm, I'm feeling a kind of physiological undertow. A lot of doctors say, whoa, whoa, I'm not an addiction specialist. And it's the person who wrote them the prescription, which to me feels pretty problematic. In the center there, please. Um, I remember when your 2017 article came out, and it was um, just so comprehensive, and really the first time I had ever written, <laughs> written, read about the Sacklers, and I was just curious to know more about like your process. When did you start to having conversations, interviews, and things like that, and realize, like, wow, this is a really huge story? Um, and was there anything in that research and writing process that you felt particularly shocked by? I mean, there's many shocking things as part of the story, but was there like one thing that you were like, wow, this is... This is huge. Sure. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I, I've been writing for The New Yorker for 15 years, and part of what I love about my job is that I, most of the time what happens is I write a story. I get what, by journalistic standards, is a long time. I'll spend six months or eight months on a story. And usually, um, when I finish, I'm done. Like, I just move on. That book uh, that you mentioned, Rogues, which just came out this summer, is 12 stories from over the course of the last 12 years from The New Yorker. And each of those stories, I wouldn't change a thing. I got to the end, and I felt like I've done it. This is the version of this story I wanted to tell. And three times now, I've gotten to the end and thought, oh my god, I've just scratched the surface. There's so much more here. The challenge with the Sacklers was that I did feel that way, but I also thought it would be impossible to write a book um, when I finished the piece in 2017. Because of that thing I said earlier about how I want 
My, I want my, my stories to read like novels. I want you to feel like you're in the room with the person. And what I worried about was I didn't think I could get enough information about them if they weren't going to talk to me. I didn't want to write a book where you would feel like you were looking at them through a telescope. I wanted to write a book where you would feel like you were in the room with them. And I didn't think that was possible initially. And then what happened was when you write one of these stories in a place like The New Yorker, it's kind of like putting the bat signal in the sky. <laughs> you just say, like, I'm on, the, you know, I'm on the job. I'm right over here. And suddenly people come out of the woodwork. So you know, I start getting these emails. I get an email from this guy who says, hey, I read your article in The New Yorker. Would it interest you to know that in the late 1960s, I was Richard Sackler's college roommate? <laughs> yes, it would interest me to know that. <laughs> Uh, and I started getting those, and, um, and then the other thing that happened is that, the, the, um, is that Maura Healy, who's another of the heroes of my book, who is the Attorney General of Massachusetts and now Governor-elect of Massachusetts, um, first, first out lesbian governor in the United States, amazingly, um, she, uh, she was the first, so every single state was suing Purdue Pharma, Maura Healy was the first state attorney general to say, I don't just want to sue the company. What about the family that dominated the board and owns the company? I want to individually sue members of the family. So she did, and, and then she had a wedge, which was she could get discovery. And so suddenly, because she did that, suddenly I had access to these unbelievable internal documents. And as a... Um, you know, as a reporter, but also somebody who went to law school, I love nothing more than legal documents. I, I, think, I think other people see like a boring stack of paper, and to me, I just see gold. And, and so in this case, what it meant was that the book, even though they didn't cooperate, much of the book is told in their words because I have their emails. And um, you know, one of my favorite things is I got, I got a, uh, some of you may have WhatsApp chats with your, with your family members. I got a year-long WhatsApp log of the Mortimer Sackler family. It's like, like group chat with their family. Um, and there are these wonderful moments where, the, where Mortimer Sackler Jr. Um, says to his family members, like, because already there's litigation and a lot of attention on them, and he says, guys, we should really keep all this on the WhatsApp because it's more secure. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> so nobody... ladies and gentlemen, I know you, we could listen to him all day long, but we've run out of time. If you have more questions or you want his book signed, please come get in a line on this Thank side. You. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Dr. Sherbert.